What is up, everybody? Welcome to the 585 Report. Uh, Mitch Broder with my co-host here, Ryan Sullivan. I know I, I was gone again, everybody. I know, I know. It's uh, you know, I'm, I'm busy doing uh, some summer work this 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 summer. So, uh, but Ryan's been killing it. I think you know, had Nate Geary on, great show. If you didn't listen to that, absolutely give that a listen. Nate is always, I think Ryan has some of the more you know interesting opinions. And one of the more entertaining, you know, listens, honestly, I think, out, out of the Bills media community. It was a, it was a lot of fun. Nate, Nate was a great guest, and it was kind of fun to just ask him some questions and see him just kind of go off and everything. So it was it was a great show. I recommend going listen to it. I miss Mitch, obviously, um, and we'll, we have some other great guests lined up for later in the summer. So, uh, but make sure you go check that out. Definitely, it's, definitely. It's good to have you back, Mitch. Absolutely. Hey, it's good good to be back. And hopefully, you know, I'll be here moving, you know, from, from here on out. But uh, uh, anyways, though, Bill's Twitter kind of, you know, lit up, I guess you could say, this week. And it feels like it's kind of every week is something new. Ryan, I don't know if you, if you get that feeling where it's always this new debate that everyone's kind of going crazy over. Well, it's peak off season right now. It's It's we're either fighting with Ravens fans or we're – in we're mad at pff or it's just it's always something that that's peak off season silliness right or or apparently zach Ertz is getting traded again you know too so <laughs> i mean it's but like you said though yeah i mean this is what happens when we're in the thick of the off season right now there's i mean again this is the, the quietest most dead time of the year for football fans and yeah, like you've said you know the ravens fans have been coming out saying that you know, Stefan Diggs made Josh Allen the quarterback that we saw in 2020 and that, you know, without Diggs, Allen wouldn't be nearly as good as what he is. And we decided, hey, let's let's just discuss that and in, in general, Allen's development and, and what really kind of happened, what we think really led to Josh turning into the quarterback that he is um, right now. So, I, I want to start with you, Ryan, because our first kind of topic about this conversation is simply, you know, who played the biggest role in Josh Allen's, you know, jump from year two to year three. And I, I wrote a list of a few things and people that I think were, you know, that led to this. But I'm curious on what you kind of have and what you think led to that big jump that, you know, everyone's been, you know, debating on Twitter for this past week or so. We've talked so much on this podcast. I think at an earlier show we even talked about how how the they would have been different. How Josh and like guys like Josh and Sam Darnold would have turned out if they were in different spots. And when I was going through this, I did the same thing. I made a list, and ultimately my number one list. And regardless of where you are, regardless of your weapons. You need to be a good quarterback, and good quarterbacks will show out. Josh got better because Josh got better. And there were outside factors. There was consistency in the coaching staff. But Josh became a better quarterback, period. This is, these numbers were not artificial numbers. These were not numbers propped up by some Mickey Mouse offense. Josh became a better quarterback in the NFL, period. And I, I invite people... If you have Game Pass, go back and watch some 2018 games. I watched a couple yesterday just to kind of see some stuff. And one of the things that really stood out to me, the difference between 2018 Josh and 2020 Josh, or even 2018, 2019, 2020 Josh, is he's you can tell that he learned he how to not have to do as much. One of the things that really stood out to me, about some of those 2018 games is you watch some of those games and there'll be someone open underneath. There'll be someone open on a check down, but he's still taking the super hard throw. As his career has gone on, he's learned to take the easier throw. He's learned to take what the all the defense gives him. That's been massive. I think he's learned how to read defenses. You remember one of his big issues early in his career is he would have, you know, two or three plays a game where he just, didn't read the protections right, and then there'd be a free rusher. You watch him at the line now calling out protections, calling out blitzers, and it doesn't happen as much. So Josh, from a physical standpoint, from a mental standpoint, from even 
mechanic standpoint, I'm not gonna. I, I I don't have the qualifications to sit here and say he fixed this, he fixed that. But you know, you you listen to stuff like Jordan Palmer and stuff that Josh says, like fixing his shoulders and getting his feet right. But Josh became it's a better quarterback regardless of what was around him over his first three years in the NFL. Yeah, and that kind of segues perfectly what you know what I have in my notes because the first thing I have for what played the biggest role in his development was Josh himself. Like you said, you know, this is a guy that has it. I, you know, I, I know that's kind of a cliche, but he's just a little different. And I, and, and I'll get more into this, I think, kind of later in the show. But just think about like Josh Allen's work, you know, his, 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 his work ethic, how hard he works, how bad he wants to be a better quarterback. I know that a lot of players work hard in the offseason, but it seems like Josh Allen just works a little bit harder than, than, than most and kind of, does everything that you see some of the some of the greatest quarterbacks in this game how they approach their training and how they approach the offseason how they strive to improve every little you know bit of their game so i think that like you said Josh Allen himself is probably the biggest reason why he became a better quarterback but i'll just list off some things and keep in mind listen to what i don't say here i think first of all Jordan Palmer played a massive role in this development i think that you that can't be understated or, or, or I cannot be, you know, emphasized enough. I think Jordan Palmer fixed Josh Allen's mechanics and got him just simply confident and, and, and a real belief that he can play at this level and excel at this level. I think that Brian Dable has played a huge role. I mean, we've people have talked about that. It was a big reason why he almost got hired as a head coach this offseason was because of the work he's done with Josh Allen. And I think Ken Dorsey has played a huge role as well in working with Allen every day during the season. And then at the end, I have better weapons. Point being, what I'm trying to say there is like, better weapons alone didn't make Josh Allen take this jump. It was Josh Allen, but it was a ton of other people working with Josh Allen and teaching him what to do and fixing the flaws in his game and helping him develop. It wasn't just Cole Beasley and Stephon Diggs and now all of a sudden Josh Allen's a you know MVP candidate. It, this, this were a, a lot of people working alongside Josh to get him to this point. And I want to sit on the Dable point for a minute because, first off, having the same offensive system for three straight years is massive. I don't care what level of quarterback you come in, whether you're one of these pro-ready guys, quote-unquote, whether you're Josh, who was incredibly raw and had 10,000 less snaps than the normal quarterback coming into the draft. And it's not just that Dable's been a good coach. He's changed. He's figured out what works well for Josh. In 2019, Dable used play action 23% of the time when passing. This year, he used it 27% of the time when passing, and and they were one of he was pre- one of the most effective play action passers in the NFL. Knowing what gets Josh comfortable, drawing up drawing up route concepts that are going to be easiest for Josh and helps uh, helps accent Josh's talents the best being able to use all of Josh's tools, whether that's running the football, whether that's, you know, these RPOs that forces defenses to account for different things. So having Dable there for three years and having the kind of relationship with that coaching staff that I think they're clearly very comfortable with each other. They're not afraid to call each other out. They're not afraid to critique each other. has been absolutely massive. And, this will kind of transition to our next point, you know, when it comes to pass catchers, I, and I have some stuff just going through a couple of other teams who've kind of been in similar situations where you can measure the effectiveness of quarterback with the same weapons. But you see, we've seen bad quarterbacks with good weapons not succeed. We've seen the 2014 Bills who had uh, Marquise Goodwin, Robert Woods, Sammy Watkins, Chris Hogan, who none of them are Stephon Diggs level receivers, but that's a that was a wide receiver core full of NFL talented wide receivers, who was a 24th in the NFL in DVOA in 2014 because they had Kyle Orr and EJ Manuel throwing them the ball. So you see a team in the Bears who has Allen Robinson, and they're terrible because they have Mitch Trubisky, and Nick Foles throwing them the football. So you can have all the pass catchers in the world, and it helps. And it, it helps a lot to have those pass catchers. And I think what made Buffalo unique this year was they found pass catchers that 
really helped Josh Allen succeed because of their ability to separate. Josh is still a guy who struggles a little bit with anticipation. He's a guy who, you know, isn't really throwing guys open that much. So getting a guy like Stefan Diggs, who his thing is separation, I think that really helped him in that regard. But once again, this idea that he made him, or even that Josh made Diggs, I, I think is just unfair because you see it all the time. If you're a good quarterback, you'll produce regardless of what's there. And if you're a bad quarterback, you're not going to produce regardless of who's there. Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up the, you know, the Bears example because the Bears loaded up on talent for Mitch Trubisky. They got him Allen Robinson. They drafted Tariq Cohen. They they brought in, you know, some some playmakers. And they've even done it up until last year when they brought in Jimmy Graham. They've drafted David Montgomery. I mean, when you look on paper, you know, that Bears offense, playmakers-wise, is pretty darn good. But like you said, they, you know, Mitch Trubisky, who I'm not going to say he's a terrible quarterback. He's a very average quarterback, I think, in the National Football League, I, I think you can say. And, that you know, that didn't pull, you know, elevate Trubisky to the point where the Bears offense was ever truly a threatening unit that you were scared about for any defense. And on top of that, too, you know, Stephon Diggs was a perfect fit for what the Bills do and what the Bills need and what Josh Allen needed. But let's not act like Stephon Diggs, you know, was putting up 100 plus yards or 100 plus catch seasons year in and year out with the Minnesota Vikings with Kirk Cousins and Sam Bradford and all these guys. You know, this was a dude that only had one 100 catch, you know, season before 2020. So again, and I'm not trying to like diminish Stephon Diggs or anything, but my point being is that it's not like Stefan Diggs was this all pro receiver in his days with the Vikings. And that's where I think when people have this argument of, well, Diggs made Allen, I, you know, that's where I kind of look at it and say, I'm not so sure about that because this is not a guy that was considered an elite receiver in Minnesota. He was considered to be a very good receiver, but nothing like how, you know, I mean, again, you see these receiver rankings, he's consistently right there up with, you know, Adams in the Hills of the world. So, Again, I think that it's one of these things where for Diggs, the, the, the ability to produce like this was always there. He wasn't utilized correctly in Minnesota, and he's just developed as his career has gone on. And Josh Allen taking this leap, they just kind of coincidentally happened together. And that's where I think from at least you know, on my perspective is, is what kind of occurred here. It isn't one guy really pulled up the other. It was just two great players both took that massive leap together. Well, and let, let's look at it this way. Look at where Diggs came from. If you want to say it's wide receivers that make the quarterback, he came from a team that had two really number one wide receivers in Adam Thielen and himself. Kirk Cousins' best year, he had about 4,200 4, yards. He had about a QB rating of 105 and a QBR of, of 60. In his in Josh's year with Diggs and Brown and Beasley and Davis, Josh went for 4,500 yards, a 107 rating, and an 81 QBR. So, and you want to even go through some other teams that I kind of have written down in terms of how different quarterbacks can produce with different talent. Think about those Alex Smith Chiefs that had the same exact, basically the same exact talent that they had now with Pat Mahomes. Alex Smith's last year in KC, over 15 games, he goes 4,000 yards, 104 rating, 65 QBR. In Pat Mahomes' first year, he goes 5,000 yards, a 113 rating, and an 80 QBR. Look at Tampa Bay. They go, all they really change is they go from Jameis Winston to Tom Brady on the offensive side of the ball. They still have all those same wide receivers. And they go from having a DVOA at around 23 or 24 in 2019 to being third in offensive DVOA in 2020. And all they did was change quarterback. So you can bring in all the offensive talent in the world. You can have all pro receivers, all pro running backs. But ultimately, if you have a good quarterback, they are going to produce. They are going to have good numbers, period. And will they have as good numbers? Will they have to work a lot harder if they don't have that talent around them? 
Yes. But to say that, you know, to say that Josh, that quarterbacks are only good because of this offensive talent, I think misses the point. And does it raise, I think what it does, it can help raise the floor. It can help make their job easier. And, but if you're a bad quarterback with talent, all, all you're doing is raising the floor. You're still going to have that same ceiling that you had before. I mean, I think that ultimately, you know, there's no question. There's no doubt in my mind that yes, having playmakers around the quarterback or on a young quarterback helps in development. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I mean, look again, look at a Sam Darnold. There's been a lot of issues with, with his development, of course, but one of them has been they've never given him really consistent pass catchers. And there's no question that has hurt him as far as his growth as a quarterback versus, you know, the Bills who really outside of Josh's rookie year gave him, you know, some legitimate, you know, some legitimate pieces to work with. That being said, though, like you, like you, like you mentioned, Ryan, just having good weapons alone isn't going to make a quarterback go from being average to solid, you know, to, to an MVP kind of a player. It comes down to that quarterback. And, you know, it, at the end of the day, like the Bills offense, for the most part, was identical. The pieces they had was literally identical to 2019 as it was in 2020 outside of Stefan Dix. So, you know, one of my point here is that in 2019, the Bills passing offense was nothing special. What happened? Josh Allen just improved and Cole Beasley had his career year. So, Again, I just think that with you know the with these young quarterbacks, yes, you know the weapons around them matters, and you can't give them nothing to work with and just throw them out to the wolves. But that being said, you know it kind it came this came down to Josh Allen improving in himself, and, and that's what you know really allowed this leap to occur. Absolutely, and one more note that I'll kind of add to all this: we kind of go into you know what this teaches about QB development is, you know, I talked on the front end of the show about Josh finding Josh being a taking the easier throw and a guy like Cole Beasley allowed him to do that, getting a guy like separation underneath. And, you know, I've said it before in the show and I'll say it again, Josh Allen was a different player in 2018. And you'll hear it a lot from other guys, just the lack of snaps that he had coming in the NFL was just unique in the fact that he just hadn't played the same amount of quarterback that other guys had had going into the NFL. So it's, and we'll kind of get into this in the next segment, but it's just Josh, you know, not every guy is going to be able to make that same leap as Josh, but I think the Bills just did a lot of unique things and the Bills really put together a textbook example of how to bring a young guy along with, at least with the skill sets that he has. Absolutely. And I think that kind of also, you know, leads us kind of into this, again, this just discussion about quarterback development, kind of what we learned about this. And I, like you said, I mean, that the fact that Josh Allen, I mean, I know it's been talked about so much how raw he was coming out of Wyoming and, but it is true. I mean, the guy did not play a lot of football in college and didn't play at a high level team and didn't have the facilities and all the, resources that a guy you know that a guy like Baker Mayfield had right coming out of college at playing for a you know a major division one program so something is to be said for that that at the end of the day like Josh Allen was raw but it doesn't mean that he was always going to just be a raw player you know he needed he just needed to grow and develop and that's all you know that's kind of what happened here yep yep that, that's absolutely it and you know, and I think some of the big things that really helped Josh along the way was uh, McDermott and Dable and this coaching staff allowing him to take his lumps. You know, one of the things we talked about, I've talked about when talking about the rest of the AFC and talking about Tua is I think the biggest mistake Flores made this year was pulling Tua in those big situations where he wasn't performing well. I think you're either in it to let your quarterback develop, let him figure it out, let him make mistakes, or you let him sit the year and let him learn that way. Josh had rough games 
in 2018 and 2019 that were god awful. You go back to that first Packers game, that first Chargers game that he ever played. His first three New England games were horrendous. But they kept putting him out there and kept letting him figure it out. And you talk about, you know, it's, it's a growth mindset thing. Being able to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. And, you know, I'm not a guy who thinks, I, I think if your confidence gets wrecked by getting benched or if your confidence gets wrecked by, you know, you took too many sacks as a rookie, you probably don't quite have the mental makeup to be a starting quarterback in the NFL. So I think for a guy like Josh and his mindset and what he brings as a player, him being able to come in in year one and, you know, Judge talked about it with us when he came on the show, you know, there really wasn't a, a mentor in that QB room until later in the season. But I just think the experience of him getting out there and figuring out what he can do, what he can't do was, was, was massive. And I think it, that kind and just stuff that I think some team, sometimes teams don't let their rookie quarterbacks experience, which is just struggling. Right. And, and you got to give Brian Dable and Sean McDermott, you know, credit because at the end of the day and, and Brandon Bean too, like they were all in on Josh Allen from day one and they were prepared to deal with any choppiness, any, 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 you know, rough moments. And like you said, you know, bumps in the road that were going to come with that. And there were many. I mean, like you mentioned, some of the games Josh Allen's rookie year were rough and hard to watch, especially now when you see the player he's become. It's almost unrecognizable. You know, the the player that was then and that you know in that Packers game in particular, I remember. You know, that was that was just unwatchable. So I think that you have to give them you know credit. They, and and that's again what has helped. You know Josh Allen because it feels like with a lot of NFL quarterbacks, Ryan, it's either you know that rookie season, it's either you know you know it makes you or it breaks you. And for Josh Allen, you know it certainly didn't break him. I mean, he came out of that, and you could tell by the end of his rookie season, he was already starting to kind of figure things out. The game was already starting to slow down for him a little bit. You started seeing more and more consistent play out of him. So, you know, you have to take that into account that you know, like you said, with 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 you know with. Brian Flores pulling Tua out in those big moments in games, you know, for Tua, that had to have, you know, wrecked his confidence that they won't even allow him to win a game, you know, a big game when it's tight on the road, you know, for example, you know, that game against the Raiders. So I, you know, I, I think you have to give some credit to the Bills organization for saying from day one, Josh Allen's our guy, he's our quarterback, and we're willing to take on any, you know, bumps in the road that come with him and his development. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, another thing that I think is important when it comes that I think we kind of learned from Josh Allen and his process as a quarterback is you got to allow time. And it's kind of been the theme this whole offseason with this whole Bills roster is allowing time for your quarterbacks at, to develop. And it took two years. And I think a lot of, our thinking around quarterbacks lately has been skewed by guys like Deshaun Watson and Pat Mahomes and Russell Wilson who came in and lit the league up. You know, it's, we forget that it's quarterback starting as rookies and balling out as rookies. is kind of a newer concept. When I was, when I was coming up as a football fan, Guys starting as a rookie wasn't really a thing that happened all that much. Sitting guys as a rookie, kind of like Pat Mahomes did, was was the norm. So when Josh Allen comes in and struggles in those for that first year, so many people I want to write him off, whether it's you know coaches, fans, whatever. But regardless of how many snaps you have, regardless of how much football you've played professional football is, is a super complex game. It's a game that's exponentially faster than what you see in the college level. So I think another thing teams can learn from Josh Allen here from this, from this development of Josh Allen is just allowing time and being patient. And, you know, I don't think we, we, we had a conversation Early in one of our earlier shows is, you know, can there be a jo another Josh Allen? 
And no, I don't think there's another Josh Allen in terms of maybe guys who can make that jump. But I do think there may be guys who could have been good quarterbacks had they just been given another year to figure it out or had they been given the right tools around them or the right coaching staff or had the right level of consistency around them to be able to figure it out. So, you know, I I think that it'll be, you know, I'm fascinated to see what it, what quarterback development looks like going on from here, whether we're going to see teams lean too much into that giving quarterbacks a third year. You know, I think this year it's going to be really telling with guys like Daniel Jones and Drew Locke, if he wins that job there, you know, is this something that's replicable you can replicate with other quarterbacks? Yeah, I think that, you know, Allen certainly taught or was an example of, you know, like you said, some guys just need some time and it just requires patience to let them go out there, get their reps, experience, you know, what they need to experience and, and, and grow from them. And, you know, right. I mean, this whole idea about rookie quarterbacks just stepping in and just lighting the league on fire. I mean, again, this, this was not common 10 years ago in the National Football League. This wasn't really a thing. You know, even a guy like Cam Noon, who, you know, put up monster stats as rookie year, but, the, but that was a guy that still took him three years to really come into his own and change that Panthers organization. So, you, you know, I think that people often get caught up in the, the Justin Herberts and the Andrew Luck kind of seasons that are just mesmerizing. And they are becoming more common. I think a lot of that is just because a lot of the college offenses, a lot of the, you know, a lot of some of the some of the schemes you see coming out of college, you know, are starting to, you know, really, uh, you know, matriculate into the NFL. But at the end of the day, I mean, some guys just need time. Some guys just need reps. Some guys just need experience. And Josh Allen was that guy at the end of the day. He just needed more time to get used to playing the NFL and frankly, just playing it quarterback i mean again i i I don't think you really stress that enough this is a guy that did not play a ton of football you know in college he played a season and a half i mean he got injured twice he you know this was not a typical quarterback you know development from day one even before he he stepped foot in, in the national football league and i think that you know like you said like and like we said i mean josh allen it, will there literally ever be a Josh Allen? Probably not, just because his development was so was frankly, Ryan, it was it, it was it was such a an outlier, you know, in comparison to quarterback development. So, um, but that being said, you know, like you know, it, I think that he showed that some guy, a guy like Trey Lance. I mean, I th- I think Trey Lance, Ryan, is going to really show everyone. How if Josh Allen was truly one of one, or if this is something that can be done with other players? I think that that is going to be the most fascinating quarterback development we, we see over the next couple of years in the NFL. Well, that's the and I think that's the right spot for it to be in. I, Kyle Shanahan's a guy who has job security. One of the things I have in my notes about you know things we learn about this is limiting turnover. I, Kyle Shanahan's a guy who's going to have the keys to that organization for a while. Whether, you know, he deserves it or not, I he, for a guy who's only had one winning season, he has a lot of uh, pedigree behind him. But regardless, he's going to have the keys of that organization for at least next three, four years. He already has, you know, getting Trent Williams massive. They have a good offensive line there. They have really good pass catchers. They got pass catchers that I think help a young quarterback. You know, they have a... A Debo Samuels, and they have just talent. You know, they a, an organization that's kind of built if they're healthy. And you know, it kind of leads to my next point: is you cannot invest too much. And I think where a lot of teams have made a mistake is you cannot invest too much on the offensive side of the football. And it's not just pass catchers. Look what Buffalo did from 2018 to 2019, switching up that entire offensive line, bringing in. At the time, it was, uh, you know, Ty Nasecki in 2018, 2019, bringing in Mitch Morse, bringing guys along like John Feliciano to be a reliable starter. Uh, guys like now Daryl Williams 
and really creating a effective, a more effective offensive line. Quinn in Spain, who was a nice piece for a year, and now beefing that up in the draft, you can never put too much emphasis on, you know, we talked about in the draft, building in those trenches as well. And that's another thing that this this development has shown us is that you have to go all in on protecting your quarterback. Look at Russell Wilson, who for the last seven years has been running for his life behind the line of scrimmage because Seattle hasn't invested. And how many times we get to watch games where Josh has a nice clean pocket or he has time to throw because of how strong the offensive, they built that offensive line to pass block. So, you know, that's another thing that I, that I think that we kind of learned from this is you look through these offseason, they just keep adding depth at offensive line. So you can never really invest too much on that side of the football. And another thing the Bills have just done a really textbook job in doing in, in this development cycle of, of a rookie quarterback. Absolutely. And I think to go back to, you know, one of the points you made, I mean, continuity is, is, is crucial for a young quarterback. I think that there's, you know, a pretty obvious reason why out of that, you know, again, out of that 2018 quarterback class, why Allen and Lamar Jackson have been the most successful is because they've had stability in that organization that they got drafted by from day one. They've had the same head coaches, the same front office, the same coordinator. And, and that's been incredibly, I think, important when it comes to, you know, quarterback development. And, and I think that if you don't have that stability, you know, you kind of, it, it is just almost a death sentence, if you will, for, for these young, you know, for these young quarterbacks. So, and, and like, and again, like you mentioned the offensive line, I mean, you know, Brandon Bean knew it year one for Josh Allen, that O line wasn't going to cut it and invested an absurd amount. I mean, I don't think people remember when the, you know, all those free agent signings were coming out going into that 2019 offseason and it was just offensive lineman after offensive lineman after offensive lineman for the bills and it was almost a kind of a, a running joke but you know at the end of the day it was what was necessary to build an o-line to give the young quarterback time to throw and keep them upright and i don't think that you know and, and i think that kind of goes back ryan to this whole thing about the bills being all in on josh allen they were going to give him everything possible to succeed and that's what they've done and, and here's one more thing I'll add, you know, in the no turnover. I, I think what's what's also been key in, in building Josh Allen, I think building successful quarterbacks is linking that quarterback to the front office and to the coaching staff. Josh is linked with Dable and Bean, or excuse me, McDermott and Bean. Look at some of these other franchises. Look at what, what one of the things that went wrong with Darnold. He gets drafted by a different GM, a different coach who get fired. And they bring in a coach and a GM who have nothing to do with him, who didn't draft him, who weren't in on the process. And when you haven't done the same work as the previous people who drafted him, you're not as invested in those guys. You know, it. you look at, it's why... I think San Francisco has a really good chance of working out because Kyle Shanahan and, and, and Lynch over there will be linked to Trey Lance guys who have been successful tend to have, you know, have, you're going to be more, but be me, be more bought in to guys that you drafted. And that's why I think it'll be interesting to watch the development of a guy like Herbert, who he's going to have the same GM. He's going to have a different coach. He's going to have a different OC coming in. So, you know, you, you may be less bought in to a guy that wasn't your guy during the draft process and just keeping and trying to, you know, keep stuff like offensive schemes similar. It, it's hard to learn new offense. It's hard to learn new playbooks. It's hard to install offenses year after year after year. We talked with Nate Geary last week and how hard it had to be for Baker Mayfield to go from Hugh Jackson to Freddie Kitchens to Stefanski. That stuff, and 
That's why Savansky won Coach of the Year, being able to do to have that effective of an offense. To have that effective of an offense for um after not having really an offseason to install that. So I, I don't think there's enough that can really be said about consistency and about uh, continuity in coaching staff in front office in terms of the connection between buy-in with the players and the coaches. Yeah, I, I 100% agree with you, Ryan. And, I mean, I think that, you know, keeping, again, stability in the organization is huge. Because I think at this point, right, for Josh Allen, because I was listening to, to Joe Marino, uh, in one of his episodes of Locked On Bills. And, you know, he was saying at this point, Josh Allen is kind of above X's and O's, physically and mentally. The guy is tremendous pre-snap and post-snap. He's smart as hell. Physically, he's gifted. Like, for people, for example, for people, you know, scared about what's going to happen with Brian Dable and who they're going to replace him with when he inevitably gets a head coaching job at some point, I don't think it really matters because Josh Allen can kind of make any scheme work. And, of course, you couldn't say that about him a year or two ago. So that's the thing that... For quarterbacks, eventually, if the development goes right, they'll get to a point where if there is a turnover at offensive coordinator or a head coach or something like that, that they can still be the player that everyone thinks they are. But for, for a younger guy, you know, for, for that's why, like, it's kind of, like you said, it's kind of remarkable that Baker Mayfield was able to turn things around after his kind of disastrous second season with all that turmoil and all that, all, all that transitioning going on in that organization. So I think that, yeah, that can't be stated enough the importance of continuity and keeping things in the organization stable while you have a young quarterback. Well, and, and look, <clears throat> who have been some of the more successful quarterbacks over the last few years? Tom Brady had the same head coach in New England for how long? He had the same couple of coordinators for how long in that organization? It. Eli Manning, guy like Eli Manning, how many different times did he go through different coordinators with the Giants? It's, it is just incredibly hard to win when you're constantly, constantly turning stuff over. Uh, and I guess my last couple notes at all is I kind of just cycle through this stuff and just kind of go through kind of how this building process is. One other thing that I, I really appreciate that this coaching staff has done is if you go back through the last couple of drafts, one of the things they're always doing as well is they're keeping the cupboards cupboard stocked with talent. They all but one year they've drafted a wide receiver, and with the way these wide receiver classes are going, is you they're getting deeper and deeper and deeper just because of the way football is being played and football is being coached at a younger level. They go and get Gabe Davis last year comes in and, be, and becomes a successful. You know, an accessible wide receiver four in this offense. This year, they go out and they get Marquez Stevenson, a guy with really deep top end speed who is going to push Isaiah McKenzie for a job and maybe a better overall receiver than Isaiah McKenzie. As we, you know, it's something we can discuss as we head towards some of our camp previews and stuff like that. So it's building a court. You know, I, I think what's been really impressive is just the consistency, not just in the coaching staff, but in their approach to this. And they're in a spot where if someone, if they lose digs, it's not going to be the end of the world anymore because they're going to have a deep, deep trough of wide receivers, whether that's going to be Emmanuel Sanders who can step up next year, whether that'll be Gabe Davis who can maybe step up, whether that's going to be, you know, Isaiah Hodges, who's everyone, everyone is falling in love with in camp this year. And you think about about all those years where our our fifth wide receiver was Walt Powell or Greg Solis or you know we uh, after we got to wide receiver five it, it was a guy that was working at Walmart two weeks ago so it it, it really takes you know they take it takes a village to raise a child it takes a it takes a whole organization to develop a quarterback yeah for sure I mean. And on top of that, too, to kind of build off your point, you know, what's been something that Josh Allen's also done every season in his career? Which is why, you know, to go back to the whole reason for this episode, this whole debate about Dix making Allen, well, every year Josh Allen's been a quarterback, at least one of his receivers 
is had a career year. You know, 2018, I mean, he made Zay Jones and Robert Foster look like real weapons in the National Football League. I don't even know Robert Foster's in the NFL anymore. Like, you know, I think, you know, Miami. it's not Miami. Okay, there you go. I, I thought he was still on like Washington or something like that, or Green Bay maybe. But, you know, and Zay Jones, who's turned out to be a nothing on the Raiders. But those two guys looked like for real options, right? In 2018, 2019, John Brown goes for over a thousand yards, most receptions in his career, career for him, right? Last year, you know, Diggs obviously explodes. Cole Beasley nearly goes for a thousand yards. Like, you know, kind of back to my point where it's Josh Allen's kind of above X's and O's. As long as you don't give him complete crap, he's going to produce and he's going to elevate the play of his receivers around him. I mean, even look at a guy like Gabriel Davis. That was a fourth round pick who everyone said, oh, you know, he's a project player, whatnot, whatnot. And the guy almost went for 600 yards and had seven touchdowns last year. And as much as that is him being a good football player, Josh Allen definitely got a lot out of Gabe Davis too. So, uh, you know, I think I think that that is something to also take into consideration when you talk about this is that, you know, Josh Allen can elevate the play out of the guys around him big time. Yeah, and I, and I think to, to kind of put a, a, a bow on all this, talk which we restarted did, did Diggs make josh allen that was the, the debate that was the argument that people brought forth there has never been a wide receiver who made a quarterback Diggs did not account for the end of the day Diggs did not make josh allen throw for 1500 more yards Diggs did not make josh allen jump his completion percentage by 11 points they did not make him raise his qbr by 40 points did it help? Was it? Did it play a role? No, but you can look through the history of football, and you can look through whatever teams you want to look through, and it is it ultimately. And it sounds like simple, but it, it's something that was being debated. It's the quarterback that's going to make that offense, and the the, the last the last last quarterback I'll leave you with. Can think about it. Look what happens when you add Philip Rivers, who was it? Who was decent last year to the Indianapolis Colts in the change you get from Jacoby Brissett in that offense with basically the same offense plus Michael Pittman to Phillip Rivers. They become a, a 500 team to a team that very easily could have been the Bills in that playoff game. So there, there is never – the point of this entire podcast that – we try and discuss is that they're just there is no wide receiver in this fo- in this league that is going to make a quarterback. The offense, the success of the team is always going to circulate around how good that quarterback is. And you know, I said I said I'd give you one that point, but look look what happens to that New England team when you take Tom Brady away, and how quickly the team turns downhill, and how <clears throat> and you look at excuse me the quality of wide receivers they drafted over the last few years, just terrible, 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 you know, drafting wide receivers and they were, were able to find success in their last year as uh, Nikhil Harry is their best wide receiver. They still won 13 games and got a first round bye. So at the end of the day, there's just, there's no wide receiver good enough that makes a quarterback exponentially better. It causes a jump that, Josh Hanlon had from 2019 to 2020. Yeah, 100%. I mean, that that that's, I think, kind of a perfect way to kind of put it. At the end of the day, you know, it, it comes down to the quarterback, and it's the reason why the drought teams of the Bills, why the drought even existed. Because the Bills had weapons during that era from the early years of it. I mean, there. I mean, I think people forget. I mean, the Bills had, you know, Eric Moulds, Lee Evans on the field together. You know, with Willis McGahey, that's a pretty good offense right there on paper, and it didn't matter because there wasn't a quarterback in place to to elevate the play of those guys. So, you know, I think you know. I mean, I'll, I want to end it kind of how how you put it, Ryan, because that's perfect. Because at the end of the day, there's there aren't examples of receivers elevating the play out of quarterbacks, and especially elevating them to the point of being legitimate MVP contenders. It just doesn't happen. I don't think it ever will happen. And yeah, that's about all I really uh, got <laughs> on the on this on this on this debate. Yep, I I think that's a really good way to put it. 
you know, if you listen to this, you can stop. You can stop fighting with Ravens Twitter about Stefan Diggs. We we got. I think we have at least the last laugh for now with that AF with the AFC division game, anyways. So breathe easy. Uh, just play him this podcast. Let's back into this podcast. Steal some of our points if you want to fight with them still. And uh, <laughs> that's all I got. Absolutely. Alrighty, everyone. So thank you so much uh, for listening. Uh, we appreciate all of our supporters, our listeners. You guys are great. Uh, again, we're Saturdays at noon now. I know it has changed. Just want to remind everyone to keep an eye out for that uh, as we kind of get into the off season. And you know, we're, I think we're out four weeks away from training camp starting. So uh, we're almost there. We're almost got you know fresh stuff to talk about um, coming up soon. So hang in there, everybody. Uh, we're Coming on close, Ryan. Any last words you want to say before we sign off? Make sure if you're not if you're not a podcast person, make sure remember you can you listen you can watch us on YouTube as well now as well too as well now. All right, you can see our beautiful faces on you know on the big screen. All right, so with that being said, for Ryan Sullivan, I'm Mitch Broder. Thank you so much for listening and have a great. day.